Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm very excited to be here, and I've been very much enjoying the other talks this morning. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to do theatrical sort of arm raises so the technician knows to flick the next slide, which he just didn't. There we go. All right. So we've heard a lot this morning um, about the impact that cancer has on our health system. We know the numbers, we've seen the charts, the number of cancer <coughs> diagnoses, the number of cancer deaths. It's the incidence rates and the burden of cancer on our health system. And again. And that's, that is why we're here today, but it also isn't. This is my best mate at my wedding with my brother. Last year, he had a stage two melanoma excised from his back. Uh, that's my dad. Um, he had a col colonic resection at Christmas time uh, to remove a large tumour. And this is my grandma. When I was a little kid, she was the world. When I was nine, I was told she was very sick with cancer and she had surgery and she had chemo, but didn't last long. We've all got stories like this. These people make up the numbers and the charts, and that's why we're here today. So I'd like to start with a quote. Scientific and medical incrementalism won't be enough. And I said that. But what do I mean? So we know the burden, we know the impact on our health system and we know the impact on our community. We have made incredible advances in increasing the sensitivity and accuracy of tumour diagnosis since Hippocrates first used the term carcinoma in 400 BC. We benefit from surgical advances and technological innovation that improves tumour excision. We've implemented chemo and radiotherapies to slow cancer spread. We're chipping away at cancer. We're dragging ourselves along in incremental steps to improvements and better diagnoses and better treatment and less deaths. But there's risks in incrementalism. Unless we stay upon a course and investing in a model that demands improvement of the same at increasing cost rather than overhauling into a new system and we find ourselves cooked. To truly disrupt cancer, we need a disruptive technology. And genetics was such a disruptive technology. Genetic material in the cell was first identified by Meissler and Kossel in the late 1800s. And the picture, of course, is the eminently recognisable pencil sketch of the DNA double helix by Francis Crick in 1953. The gradual evolution of our ability to selectively amplify and interrogate DNA has in indeed introduced a brave new world in science and medicine. It's a true disruptive technology, albeit taking decades to unspool. And you know, we're now coming to understand, as we've heard today, the molecular mechanisms contributing to cancer's origin in the body, the drivers promoting its spread and metastasis, and the responses of the body uh, in, res in the presence of cancer, genetics as a te disruptive technology, is just extraordinary. But there is a problem with genetics. If you think of your DNA as a recipe book encoding each of us, not just your hair colour and your eye colour and your skin colour, but your risk of developing a rare disease or your risk of developing a cancer, then if we're trying to establish this risk, understanding the recipe from a single word or even a series of words is exceedingly difficult. Genomics gives us the book. Now, Mark's already used this analogy today and it's a very popular one amongst us boffins, so you have to excuse me. But the human genome has about three billion bases, the A's, C's, T's and G's, and about 20,000 genes. Each copy of Tol Tolstoy's War and Peace has about three million letters. So a thousand copies would contain comparable amount of information. 
which would stack as high as a 12-storey building. And Mark would recognise a kinghorn there. So imagine taking this stack of books, putting it through a shredder, piecing it back together in order and finding the spelling mistake. That's genomics. Of course, the point of genomics is to use this information to improve our health to more accurate and cost-effective and faster diagnoses in targeted precision treatments and in determining risk, introducing preventative measures and improving management. So genomics is cool. It is disruptive technology. We're not talking about the transition from Betamax to VHS. This is the mobile phone or the internet or the autonomously driving electric hover car. But what good is that car if it stays in Audi's top secret concept labs? To disrupt cancer, genomics can't just be used in research facilities and in academia. We need to, it needs to be embedded within the health system. From the 1970s when Fred Sanger's uh, chain termination method of sequencing that I know only too well, um, and then through to Kerry Mullis's uh, devising PCR in 1983, as we've just heard from Sandra, we still only have a handful of genetic tests for cancer currently funded in the Australian healthcare scheme. Translation into the clinic is just too slow. That's all very well and good, but that one's the car for me. I've got one on order. <laughs> all right, so I digress. How do we embed genomics into the health system? To support the disruptive technology that is genomics, we need to change that system. We need to alter the very infrastructure from the bricks and mortar and from the ground up. So what we need to do is map where we are now, envisage the blue sky of where we want to be for, with input from the oncologists and the pathologists, the patients, from geneticists and the policy makers. And then we need to strategize how we get from here to there. But how do we do that? The Australian government has recognised the opportunities that lay in genomics for the health system. And they were aware of the broad sweeping changes that would need to be made to introduce genomics in a clinical setting. So in 2005, the NHMRC put out a targeted call for research into preparing Australia for the genomics revolution in healthcare. And the Australian Genomics Health Alliance was born. The AGHA is made up of over 50 Australian institutes. These are hospitals, research centres, academia, path labs, and it's coordinated out of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Victoria. It's linked with the RCPA and HGSA and networked internationally and integrates the experiences of Melbourne Genomics and Queensland Genomics, as well as Genome England and Genome Canada. The NHMRC has provided $25 million over five years for this program to demonstrate the benefit of genomics to the health system, pilot models of clinical genomics, de developing evidence and strategies to support the implementation and integration, and building upon the strengths we currently have in genomics in the research. And the health system is a complex beast. It's an organism of clinicians and pathologists, diagnosticians, hospital administrators, patients. We need to move this technology from the research domain, which is intrinsically original and unstable and bespoke, into, again, thanks, into the clinical domain, which must be proven and predictable and standardised. And again. So there are challenges to implementing whole system change to support the disruptive technology that is genomics. There's the divide between the state and federal health systems, which, you know, dare I say it, cost shifting that goes on. There's risk of duplication between the states, which is a waste of resources. No common national ethics or consent. We have data silos in each facility, let alone state. 
The workforce, as Sandra touched on, needs to be um, brought up to be genomically literate at all levels, including allied health. Where there's currently inequity of access, as many of you patients are aware. There's, we're facing inactivity and fragmentation and internal competition. However, there are strengths and opportunities to this in Australia. We have got NATA accredited sequencing facilities in each state. We've got a, we have got a national healthcare system that can provide that equity of access with a few tweaks. Um, we've got an incredible quality and capability of our clinical and research uh, networks and there's a lot of genomics currently going on. So it's the perfect time now for this sort of collaboration and the need is certainly recognised. So the way we're approaching this is that the Australian Genomics Health Alliance is made up of over 200 researchers and it's still growing. And these are clinically embedded uh, researchers to look at the very infrastructure or the pillars of the health system. So we've got a body of work looking at the National Diagnostic and Research Network, which is very much looking at um, creating these connections between state-based health, state health systems, excuse me, um, trying to establish a national uh, referral network, uh, looking at unified approaches to, to test ordering, um, what minimal data set is required for, um, as a gatekeeper to access genomics and what specialist facilities we currently have in place. And of course, as a secondary aim, we, do, we will be getting an enriched um, patient cohort that will be fed back into research programs. We've got a whole body of work looking at the workforce uh, and education and ethics requirements to support genomics. Um, so this program will be looking at the understanding the current uh, training needs and, sta and status of our clinicians, where they need to be in the future to support genomics, um, and therefore what resources need to be put into this space. The program is also looking at the psychosocial implications of genomic testing with patient surveys, etc., and it's conducting ethical analyses. Um, because the whole ethics of genomics is a bit of a, um, it's a murky waters at this stage. It all needs to be clarified. So we've heard a lot about big data today um, and the AGHA program too is looking at the changes needed to support the massive data requirements that genomics will place in the clinical system. We're looking at standard, uh, standardised clinical variant classification to move towards more common reporting guidelines across the nation. We're de developing a geno genotype phenotype database um, that will be using patient archive that's developed out of the Garvin. And that will be securely linked to international databases. So rare people with rare genetic disorders can be matched by their clinicians to fundamentally a global network of clinicians that might see a patient with the same clinical presentation or the same mutation. We're comparing and evaluating bioinformatic pipelines to look at, because every bioinformatician has their favourite pet pipeline, but what if we develop standards to evaluate these and compare them, then we have the means to draw out a best practice and share that nationally. We're looking at data sharing, which opens a whole can of worms in terms of the legality and the governance and the ethics. We're, we're in a nation that needs a national data resource and data repository, but we have state-based privacy laws. So all this needs to be addressed. We're also mapping the architecture um, that might be required to support clinical genomics on a national level. So it's an ambitious body of work, um, and it's all well and good as it stands as a research program you know, the mapping and the piloting, etc. But how are we going to ensure that this work is sticky enough to actually become embedded within the health system? Through evidence and implementation and policy. So they call health economics the dismal science, but it is the key to providing evidence of cost, effect cost effectiveness of genomics to the state and federal health departments. 
those bankrolling current clinical practice at both the health department level and clinical administrators are fearful that if genomics is, is accessible, it'll bankrupt the system. Whole genomes for $4,300, whole exomes for $2,300, how can we possibly afford this? But the health economics program is going to be teasing out when these tests are more diagnostically effective and more cost effective. So in terms of both direct cost per diagnosis and in the lifelong costs going forward. Um, Michael nicely set up this for me this morning. Oh no, this is the case study, sorry, in a second. Um, so as an example, as part of the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance, 315 children at Royal Children's Hospital were studied um, for complex childhood syndromes. They received both the traditional diagnostic tests, which were like MRI, muscle biopsy, and then sequential gene tests, as well as whole, whole genome, sorry, whole exome sequencing in parallel. In terms of the outcome, in traditional diagnostic pathways, the rate of diagnosis was 11% at an average cost per patient of $27,000. With the whole exome sequencing, 55% of those children were diagnosed at an average cost per patient of $6,000. And amazingly, 16% of them actually changed management. So, I mean, clearly this is the poster child of what we're doing currently, and this doesn't apply to all clinical situations, but when it does, it should be applied. Okay, this was the implementation science that Michael was touching on this morning. Um, it's exceedingly important that the barriers for adoption of technologies are studied and broken down at the clinical interface, otherwise this research is just going to end up in a large paper on someone's desk. Similarly, there needs to be a link directly to policy to enable this to be implemented in the health system. We've got a national implementation committee that's chaired by Mark Cormack and has representation from all the key departments, you know, the health bodies. So we've got RMAC and MSAC and PBAC, all the ACTS, including Andrew Wilson, who will be uh, presenting next. Okay, so we've discussed the health system infrastructure and we've got the evidence and the implementation and the policy, but it's all very theoretical. So we then pondered how we're going to know that genomics will actually work at the clinical interface, at the coal, at the coal phase, with the patients. So that's where we overlay our programs of work with, red, with disease flagships, projects in specific rare diseases and in specific cancers to be modelled for, uh, models for the system-wide implementation of genomic testing. These projects are national. They uh, recruit patients at multiple sites and centres. They leverage ex existing initiatives and research programs. And the idea is that they will develop, uh, help develop this routine clinical practice of genomics. Um, to prospectively recruit patients to receive genomic testing in the clinic. In the cancer front, we have uh, three flagships up and running currently. The first is a leukaemia project led by Deb White out of Samri in South Australia. Um, they'll be doing RNA sequencing and um, tilde card and a number of other uh, molecular tests um, to, and it, it links in with a regalia study. Uh, to look at leukaemias. There's a large gene panel studies um, led by Stephen Fox out of the Peter McCallum that's comparing um, standard care uh, and these large, this super panel of 400 odd genes matching uh, with the matched somatic and, and germline analysis. And that's also linked in with the Melbourne Genomics Program. Uh, and we've heard of David Thomas's work with Mark today um, He's leading a project uh, on managing patient risk, which is a, a germline um, project um, on whole genome sequencing out of the Garvin. And Robin Ward and Gillian Mitchell are leading one with the ICON um, consortium, similarly looking at germline uh, analysis by whole genome sequencing. So these projects will collectively recruit over a thousand patients, people, uh, people with uh, so these are adolescents, children and adults um, with cancer. 
And these flagships will be embedded in our programs to test the impact of genomic testing on these people's diagnostic rate, how it alters their clinical management, and whether it identifies novel therapeutic channels for them. And this is the brass tacks of what we're doing. This is why we're here. To change the management, to sway the numbers and alter the stats, to disrupt cancer. Scientific and medical incrementalism won't be enough. Genomics has the potential to disrupt the zeitgeist and alter our management of cancer. Thank you. <laughs>